government to give funds to oil palm provinces. PNG and West Papua Indigenous Art on Show. And student and teacher meeting after 44 years. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thank you for joining me for Sunday's news. The national government has for the first time allocated 20 million kina for roads in provinces developing oil palm. Treasurer Charles Abel says the funding will be parked under the agriculture sector. West New Britain Governor Sassindran Mutaville says the economic benefit will triple if these roads are completed. The allocation of 20 million kina for oil palm feeder roads is the first since independence. Treasurer and Deputy Prime Minister Charles Abel says this is to help the oil palm sector. He says the funding will cater for about 1,250 kilometers of roads identified around the country. The government coming forward and providing some funding itself to support oil palm feeder roads under the agriculture sector. But uh, driving tourism as well is very important in, uh, in West New Britain. And uh, I commend the governor for the excellent job that he's been doing. West New Britain is one province who has contributed immensely in growing the oil palm industry. Governor Sassindra Mutuvel says this funding will have significant effect on developers of oil palm, including the small growers. In the last 40 years, this is the first time ever government has allocated 20 million kina, appropriated in 2018 budget. And that to mainly support uh, the major oil palm growing centers like uh, Hoskins Oil Palm Growing uh, Region and also Biala Go uh, Oil Palm Growing uh, Association and uh, in Woro and also in Milenbi. Other provinces will also benefit from the 20 million kin allocation. These include Northern, Milan Bay, New Island and Central. However, more than 750 kilometers of road is in West New Britain. Governor Mutuvel wants a share of 50%. So we deserve at least 50% of that uh, 20 million kina, which the national government can either partner with New Britain Palm Oil or partner with OPIC and with another public-private partnership concept, whereby they can build those feeder roads. Apart from other oil palm developing provinces, Governor Mutuvel says the output of developing feeder roads in oil palm areas will have more benefit. You won't regret because this money will come in multifold or manifold in terms of tax revenue because the production will uh, uh, significantly uh, increase by fixing these roads. And also it will help many growers who wants to bring their fruits to the mill which can fetch additional 65 kina per tonne. Jack LaPavit Jr., National MTV News. Meanwhile, West New Britain Governor is throwing his support behind the move for a bill to repeal the Intergovernment Funding Act, which was amended in 2012. Governor Sassindran Mutaville says this will help provinces generate more internal revenue. For West New Britain, about $3 million will be collected annually from fees charged for goods such as cigarettes and alcohol. intention to bring a bill to appeal, uh, sorry, repeal uh, the Intergovernment Relations Functions and Funding Act which was amended in 2012 to allow the provincial governments to generate some revenue only from selected goods or dangerous goods like uh, cigarettes and uh, beer which will easily generate two to three million kina per annum for West New Britain and no need to say about uh, regional centres like Kokopo, Lake and uh, uh, even NCD it will be even up to 50, 60 million kina revenue they could generate just by charging uh, a very minor percentage on these uh, uh, few selected goods like cigarette and beer. Pomeo in East New Britain has become the 14th district to join the district cocoa nursery project initiated by the Cocoa Board of PNG. Pomeo MP Elias Kapavoris signed a memorandum of agreement with CBPNG Chief Executive Officer Botogalpu for growing 3 million cocoa trees in Pomeo over five years. This represents 6 million investments on a kina to kina basis that will see each party investing 1 million kina in 2018 and later 500,000 kina each in the coming years. A separate MOA was also signed for subsidizing cocoa freights out of remote areas in Pomeo District. Mumbai and West New Britain have also signed similar MOAs, MOAs with Cocoa Board PNG. 
Twelve delegates from West Papua are in PNG for the Indigenous Collaboration Business and Culture Show held in Port Moresby last night. It's the first time a Papua women business group joined forces with PNG businesswomen. Last night's event, the Rainbow Show, was used to showcase Melanesian art in painting, screen printing, tie dye, and many more. The Indigenous Collaboration Business and Culture Show between Papua New Guinea and West Papua was used to showcase the Melanesian art in painting, sali, PNG hand-painted fabric, and tie-dye. The Papua Women Business Group also came with their art and batik, Papua evening dress, casual wear, and office wear. These two countries can produce this kind of uh, art and showcases to uh, uh, especially here in our country and in West Papua and hopefully in the future we are going to take it, refine it and take it further. Designer Itje Kaikatui of West Papua was so happy to come to PNG as this was her first time in the country. It's the first time I come here, the first time I came here, come here to uh, Papua New Guinea, to Port Moresby and I like the people so much. Actually, all of you are brothers and sisters. Event coordinator Daylin Langarap says the event has encouraged the women to conduct business the Melanesian way. We have uh, our own way of doing business. We start off with butter and then our outline kind of products. And this is just what we are doing here. We are showcasing our products. Director of Yaolarat, Agatha Gami from East New Britain, is a designer specialized in tie-dye. Tie-dye is very unique in the country. Agatha buys the fabric from Bali and fabric paint from the United States. She markets her products on Facebook and also sells at the Chin H. Min duty-free shop at the airport and Trade Value Limited in Rabaul. Agatha also does training for those who are interested in learning the art. I'm very fortunate to be here tonight to promote my product that I do. And uh, my girls too will be on the show tonight to promote some of the, some of the, the, the fabrics that, that we do. Yeah, I do um, lap lap, sarongs, and towels, beddings, bedsheets, curtains, and different things. The leader of Parliamentary Commission One Province of Papua Ruben McGay officially launched the Dream Paradise 2018 that will be happening in October in Jayapura. He stated that it is a time for us to be successful people in our own land. <laughs> The popular West Papua tune, Tugurere, was performed live by Yakupa Womsiwar. <laughs> Lilian Sopera Kenea, National MTV News. National MTV News continues after the break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Kumul Petroleum Holdings Limited has signed a binding heads of agreement with Total for the joint marketing and sale of their shares of LNG and condensates to be produced from the Papua LNG project. Under the HOA, KPHL and Total will negotiate a shareholders agreement for an incorporated joint venture to be set up as the corporate vehicle to commercialize their combined production share. Chairman of Kumul Petroleum, Sermoy Ave, says the agreement will demonstrate the unique value between the two companies. KPHL Managing Director Wapu Sonk says the agreement will maximize output for both KPHL and Total. The agreement was signed in Port Moresby this week. 
John Kali, the former Secretary for the Department of Personal Management who has been appointed High Commissioner to Australia, met his former teacher after 44 years. It was an emotional meeting as Kali met the man who had great impact in his life. Richard Clark helped Kali become who he is today, for which he is forever grateful. It has been 44 years since John Cully has seen his teacher. In June of 1964, 21-year-old Richard Clark arrived on the shores of Papua New Guinea. He had met all the requirements for his contract and was prepared to spend time in the remote parts of PNG. Been justified, if I could use that word, yeah, justified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the benefits have been, benefits have been, been uh, reaped now. I oh, know, it's a pleasure, wonderful. Yeah. And I know that uh, John is one, but there are others who've done uh, things in their own field, in their own way. And I suppose I should say that over the seven years of, you know, you took about over 250 students, pupils yeah. went through my hands, sure. and, uh, and I would like to know that they've all done very well. Mm. And I made a little mark in their lives. While in Port Moresby, Clark taught at the school in which John Cully was a student at. Uh, he taught me twice in uh, grade 4 in 1965, when he first uh, was posted to uh, Kapara, uh, and then again in uh, 1967 when I was doing uh, grade 6. So I had two good years of uh, teaching from uh, this man here. Richard Clark returned to Australia in 1974 but the impact of his life and education he taught has made the biggest difference. <clears throat> Making a big contribution to what I am today. And uh, <clears throat> it's important for people not to forget the people who have made a difference in your life, to always go back and say thank you. Kali attributes his success to his teacher. He states that with his new appointment, he will make a bigger impact in the nation. Our education system has really dropped. Uh, and uh, you know that's one thing that I've been really pushing for. Uh, and hopefully with my appointment as High Commissioner to Australia, I can encourage uh, you know, younger teachers graduating uh, you know, from there, or even university graduates uh, encourage them to come up and work here uh, and even take, it, take up teaching uh, you know, p p positions. But most importantly, to teach our kids how to read and write. Lillian Sopera Kenea, National MTV News. International news updates when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. Darutown Mayor Samuel Wingu is calling on the national and western provincial governments to help restore Darutown to its glory days. He says the state of this service delivery and infrastructure on the island has deteriorated and needs immediate government attention. Built in the early 80s, roads continue to deteriorate, but this is not the only issue that's affecting the lives of many people on the island. From health problems, especially the TB outbreak, to resistance, to education, law and order, unemployment and other government services, the island of Daru requires all the attention. Town Mayor Samuel Wingu says not only does the town need assistance from the provincial government, but also the national government. You see, as you are here, you can see as you look around everywhere, the roads that the vehicle has driven you up and down. Uh, you've realized that all the roads with the potholes that we have, uh, and there are everything that is not in order. Uh, we have a, a health system that is uh, not really good. The schools all run down. Uh, road system, schools, health, uh, communication. Uh, if we have gone further up, you would have seen the uh, post office almost uh, torn apart. Uh, you have <coughs> that also includes the. Uh, NBC, the National Broadcasting Co Corporation owned uh, building uh, without renovation for so many years. Uh, it's totally unusable, unfit for uh, occupation and use. But uh, because we need our service to be continued, uh, 
like the schools and the NBC and all other services that still need to be uh, used without being renovated and maintained over a long period of time. So many years has passed. While the town has struggled at its hardest to combat the increasing rate of tuberculosis, many donor agencies are assisting the curable disease. TB has decreased from 30% to 1%, with the target being 0.0%. While roads on the island need urgent maintenance, schools are also facing similar challenges, where new classrooms and libraries are required to provide quality education. He added that while law and order problems in Daru is controlled, youth unemployment has increased and high school leavers are left vulnerable, unable to continue further studies. He says a project proposal to fix up the island has already been negotiated with the provincial government. We have, I have a project that is called the Daru Town Rehabilitation Project that I've, I've come up with, I've given the approval by, the, by my local level government as well as uh, approval by the District Development Authority and the Provincial Executive Council uh, most recently in December. I've taken that to Port Mosby. I've had uh, very successful negotiations with the Planning Minister Richard Maru. Uh, I've also uh, gone ahead also to see the Minister for uh, Mining, uh, Honorable Johnson Tuke. I've sat with him. Uh, he has set a date for the official presentation of the Darutown Rehabilitation Project. Godwin Eki, National MTV News. Settlers in Lay Speedway area are calling on appropriate authorities to assist them with their need for water supply. More than 3,000 people who live in the area have been affected by water problems in the past years. The main concern is health problems that come with lack of water supply. This group of people gathered here make up a small part of the 3,000 plus people that live here. This is an area behind the Lay Biscuit Company in Nawab District's Ward 14. Some of these block holders or settlers have been living here for over 15 years. One of the main challenges they face is the problem with water. They've gathered to raise concerns over the issue. Bellheavy blue mipla and mipla like him wara. Wara and me very, very important on all other plus something. They often go to the Bumbu River to bathe, do their laundry and fetch their water. They say this, however, has become dangerous for the women and children. Isabe he got plenty heavy, Isabe come up back child. Long holy Mary Pikinini blue mipla, pite him all. Na rousing bilum blong all, rape him all, Pikinini blue mipla. This is what an average house in the area looks like. They have drums to fetch water when it rains. It also becomes a breeding ground for mosquitoes, making the residents, especially children, prone to sickness. All pikini blow me blow, plant it, I'm also pine him sick. Inside Lord is la water. Now time only go yet. Some la time me blow got enough money, lo carry more go house sick. Some la time me blow silly blow block na me blow no got money. The settlers are calling on the authorities to assist them with this problem. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lane. Turning overseas, Samoa is in recovery mode tonight after Cyclone Jita ravaged the island nation. Now the storm system has Tonga in its sight. The now Category 3 storm brought damaging winds and heavy rains and forecasters say there's a chance New Zealand could also be in the firing line. Most of Samoa's capital is now underwater. Roads have turned to rivers and residents have been forced to wade through the flood for supplies. When we try to access evacuation centers here yesterday, you know, we just almost could not make through. We had to use our pickup trucks. While many areas are closed off, people still brave the conditions, using cars, trucks and even bicycles to get around. Several buildings have been flattened and authorities say more than 300 people were evacuated. A lot of families have lost their homes and some have evacuated into their other extended family homes. So far, there have been no reports of serious injury or death. 
Five evacuation centres have been opened to residents and Red Cross workers have been going door to door. While the worst of the cyclone may have passed, there's still concern for those in the outer islands and low-lying areas. There's no power and electricity in the whole country except for um, essential um, areas. So from the Red Cross, we know that there would be a lot of uh, problems on water and sanitation. Cyclone Gita passed over Samoa as a Category 1 storm system. But since then, it's been upgraded to a Category 3 and could go higher. Tonga is its next target. Without question, it's a stronger storm, though certainly uh, there's a very good chance, if not a likelihood, to be more wind damage. And with a stronger storm, higher winds, there's bigger waves, could have a more of a that coastal inundation. It's then expected to move south and could turn east during the next week. Niwa says that means there's a distinct possibility it could hit New Zealand, but what form it'll take still isn't known. Whether it falls apart before it gets close to New Zealand or whether it remains somewhat a formidable system. Again, if it, if it were to impact New Zealand, it would be an ex-tropical cyclone. That's what Fehi was when it hit New Zealand a fortnight ago. And much of the country is still recovering from that. In New Zealand, Auckland's wet weather today forced the cancellation of the big gay out for the first time in 18 years. The lower North Island was blanketed in fog, but parts of the South Island enjoyed blazing sunshine. Organisers had promised the big gay out would go ahead, rain or shine. But the deluge was so intense, health and safety became the big issue. Obviously a large number of um, power concerns. We couldn't activate the main stage. Uh, our primary concern was to take care of people, so unfortunately we had to cancel the event. Bedraggled revellers were disappointed but philosophical. Nature! <laughs> you really can't play with the nature, so yeah, really feeling bad for it. Shame, pity? No! Excitement, fabulousness, <laughs> glitter! I don't look at the weather being, being um, a damper on anything. It never rains on our gay parade, as we say. I had an umbrella and a poncho, but I've just gone, you know, beer now. It's quite, it's quite cold. <laughs> First time I've been cold in summer. Many instead prepared to head undercover for an early after party at a K-Road bar. Normally there'd be 15,000 people at this event, but the numbers were well down even before the announcement was made. Several roads in central Auckland were flooded, at least for a few minutes. Meanwhile, rain wasn't the problem in the south of the North Island. Fog forced the delay or cancellation of many flights. Fleur Douglas had to wait overnight to send her 14-year-old daughter from Wellington to Melbourne. You could tell the fog was just thick as pea soup. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, we've just been hanging around waiting for some kind of update. The boards haven't been helpful. Rapper Macklemore's fans were kept waiting after his flight to Wellington was redirected and he was forced to drive from Palmerston North for last night's concert. His support act couldn't perform, but Macklemore made it in the nick of time. The South Island's West Coast wild run continues. Another drenching like this one last weekend has caused a slip that has again closed State Highway 6 near Franz Joseph. But much of the east of the South Island has stayed dry. The makers of this ad picked the right location today, Tomahawk Beach in Dunedin. And to the Middle East, four days of intense Syrian government airstrikes have reportedly killed more than 200 civilians. President Assad's assault in the rebel-held region of eastern Ghouta has continued despite international pleas for a ceasefire. One doctor said the area is now drowning in blood. We warn viewers some of these images may be disturbing. Guta has known many appalling weeks, but few as bad as this one. Day after day of bombs and shells raining down, as those who are trapped here pay a dreadful price for living in one of the last rebel strongholds. As President Assad's forces tighten their grip, hospitals say 230 civilians have died this week alone. Many of the casualties, as these distressing images illustrate, are children. The hospitals are overwhelmed. Many patients in desperate need of evacuation to somewhere with better facilities. But that can't happen, despite appeals by the UN 
because Assad and his Russian allies won't allow it. Six-year-old Yaya is one of those being denied the chance of specialist medical care. His father explained how Yaya was playing in the street when a cluster bomb landed close by. He lost both legs. Yaya says all he can feel is pain from where his legs were. It stops him sleeping. The UN, America and France have appealed for an immediate halt to hostilities to allow the evacuation of wounded women and children from eastern Ghouta. But Russia says no. So this week is ending as it began, with bombs and bloodshed. And little reason to believe it will get anything but worse in the days ahead. Cold in Pyeongchang, but things between North and South Korea seem to be warming up. Kim Jong-un's sister has been officially greeted by South Korean President Moon Jae-in, who in turn has been welcomed to travel north and meet with Kim. In the presidential palace in Seoul today, another sign of the thaw between North and South Korea. President Moon Jae-in of South Korea welcomed this woman, Kim Yo-jong. She's the sister of North Korea's enigmatic dictator Kim Jong-un and the first member of North Korea's ruling dynasty to set foot in South Korea since the two went to war in 1950. After a spate of North Korean missile and nuclear tests and a war of words between the regime in Pyongyang and the US, President Moon wants to kickstart talks. Today, he was rewarded with an invitation to the North for a summit meeting. Another sign of the warming came on the ice as a unified Korean women's hockey team with players from both North and South competed against Switzerland. Some here in South Korea say the Olympics have been hijacked by politics. We're very upset, said this man. South Korea organized the Pyeongchang Olympics, but now they've become the Pyongyang Olympics. There's been no specific word on when President Moon Jae-in will visit the North, but it would be the first summit meeting between leaders of the two Koreas in more than a decade. The unified Korean women's hockey team lost their game 8-0. Chukai Sports is up next. Don't go away. Chukai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. The private company Netball Competition in Port Moresby has registered the highest number of participants since starting the competition more than 20 years ago. 91 teams have registered for the competition that's now a platform to promote women in sport and also build networks. Of the 15 women's divisions, the private company Netball Competition is now into its washout games. Private companies netball competition, um, in short PCNs, is the biggest competition in Port Moresby so far. Um, this season has been a very big competition compared to previous seasons because we've got a total of 91 teams. And that's, um, you, can, you can agree that that's the biggest um, um, number so far. The competition not only helps the employees keep fit, it also paves way for networking and advertising. Business houses use the competition as a venue to market their products. How the competition is run, it's very professional and uh, we try to display um, accountability in all our operations and that kind of um, goes um, a lot of interest because, you know, um, private companies is all about um, being professional and doing the things um, in, in the correct manner. The finals begin next week. The games are played every Sunday at the Rita Flynn Courts and are open to the public to come and watch. We are doing our um, washout games and then we go into the finals and all the teams are looking forward to that. Um, we also advise the public that if they're doing, not doing anything, they can come and watch finals starting next week. Stacy Yalo, National MTV Sports. 
Meanwhile, 24 business houses, including several government entities, have come together this year to take part in the corporate volleyball competition. The season started on a slow note, but is now into its second weekend of competition. The corporate volleyball competition has gone into full swing last week and is attracting a lot of crowd. The competition is expected to run until September. The competition is strictly for the employees and their spouses to take part in. The competition is separated into pools of A and B, where there are male and female teams for each pool. There is also a pool for mixed teams of both men and women in a team. Corporate teams from business houses such as BSB and BNBM were some of the teams that were seen participating today. The public is welcome to come and support their favorite corporate teams and tickets for children are sold as low as two kina and five kina for adults. Stacy Yalo, National, MTV Sports. The Lay City Dwellers have kicked off their OFC Champions League campaign on a high after defeating Tupapa Marai Renga 7-2. A goal from Nigel Dabinyaba and captain Raymond Gunemba early in the match was what set the pace for the NSL champions. Dwellers led 3-1 led at half-time before scoring another four goals in the second half, running away with the win. The Dwellers will take on Nalkutan on Friday in their next match. The Coca-Cola Ipatas Cup NCD leg rescheduled their finals for next weekend. They have also extended the number of teams proceeding to the final stages. They began with the knockout stages today at the Coney Tigers Oval in Port Moresby. With a reschedule in the tournament, they have allowed for the top three teams to proceed to the knockout stages. The CEO of uh, the Ipatas Cup uh, and uh, the other Executives are confirmed to say that this competition here in the national capital uh, will be extended to next week, the final. So we have got uh, three teams, top three in all the four pools. We have got a, 12, a total of 12 uh, uh, teams playing now and uh, draws have been adjusted. A few participating teams have set great standards in this year's competition with players from the Intercity Cup taking part. With the inclusion of teams like, uh, you know, uh, North Wilhelma, it is an op a professional approach in some of the clubs that we've seen here over the last uh, couple of days. They've taken a professional uh, approach, they've uniformed the teams very, very well. They've come here and uh, they played uh, games at a very high level. The finals are said to be held next weekend, where a lucky team will be given a golden pass, proceeding to the next phase of the competition. Quarter finals and set up the final, go to preliminary final. If there is uh, only one goal pass, then we play the grand final. If we have two goal passes, then we just play the two preliminary finals and the winners get the uh, goal passes. The Oval is expected to be packed with many supporters out to back their teams. Lige Levet, National, MTV Sports. The John Cowper Rugby League competition has been played out at Nine Mile outside Port Moresby since November last year. Northeast member John Cowper wants to see youths in his electorate progress through sport. The competition is in its elimination rounds. With the grand final three weeks away, events coordinator Felix Atusa says it's been a very good competition so far for the youths in the area. With top 16 teams now competing to make the top eight sports, four winning teams from both the B and A grade will go into top eight positions. And we play 30 plus teams all together. So there's like 30 plus teams here. We play Brooklyn Golden Long, a two plus pool, pool A and 15 plus teams, now pool B and 15 plus teams. So far, we play play uh, ten rounds, which competition we play and start late, mid uh, November. So we play not long play long rounds, but we play uh, cutting come down on ten rounds. The competition also brought in many young people from other parts of Port Moresby to participate. He says, from the interest shown by the players, it is possible teams in the competition can form a team to participate in the Port Moresby Rugby League competition. Some PRL where and play names, some setting long one time it's like plan blame and most of them people are like creating one like league blame like that so that people can select them of the best of the best long uh it's like four play like trader what five six and nine twelve now they kiss him to platin going to the pr and most of them some people picture them below the end next week's competition will see top eight teams go head to head to make it into the top four positions 
Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. Don't go away. Chukai Sports continues after the break. Chukai Sports. Welcome back to Chukai Sports. The Hela Provincial Government has allocated 10 million kina for its first stadium. Hela Governor Philip Undialu cut the ribbons to launch the Aguru Memorial Stadium project in front of hundreds in Tari Town. Tari Development Corporation is the company contracted to build this stadium. Kumul Petroleum Holdings has supported with 1 million kina. The stadium is designed by an Australian company and construction will begin later this year. Doesn't matter what level you play, there's no better feeling in sports than winning. It makes all of the hard work and sacrifices worthwhile and the excitement can sometimes get the better of us. Here's this week's Sporting Moments. He's more accustomed to singlets and stubbies day to day. So it's fair to say Tom Walsh pushed the boat out in the fashion stakes at this week's Halberg Awards. I can't believe this. Uh, I never thought that I'd be on live TV wearing a skirt. While the Sportsman of the Year was more concerned by what he was wearing, Team New Zealand was pondering what many Supreme Award winners are bound to have considered. Struggling to figure where we put the uh, rum, to be honest. But, uh... <laughs> Maybe they should ask Sri Lanka's Nirashan Dikwela how to conceal alcohol. Sure looked like he'd had a few before facing Bangladesh. It was a dolly. He cannot believe it. And neither could New Zealand rugby fans. The Blues lifting a trophy? Champions! Good to see the returning Carlos Spencer hasn't forgotten who butters the bread. From a former shirtless sports star to a current one, Tonga's buff and oiled up Winter Olympian getting his kid off again for the opening ceremony. Well, he's without a top. And while some of his competitors froze on the big stage, Kiwi Carlos Garcia Knight shone on the slopes of South Korea. And if anybody thought that yesterday was a fluke, Carlos Garcia Knight has just proved again that he has a chance. It took some of the best in the world to stop him claiming a medal. But what a performance and what a start to our Winter Olympics campaign. And that ends Chukai Sports. There were the details for the next 24 hours when we come back. Chukai Sports. Chukai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. Looking at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow, a shower or two can be expected all across the southern region in Port Moresby, Daru, Kerema, Alotau and Popondita. In the Mumasa region, mostly fine in Medang, Wewak and Vanimo and thundery showers in Leh and Wau. In the New Guinea Islands region, mostly fine in Loringa and Kaviang, a shower or two in Kokopo, Rabal and Kimbe and fine weather in Buka. And in the Highlands region, mostly fine across the region. Forecast for small ships for the next 24 hours. Strong wind warning current for all coastal waters of northern PNG Indonesian border through Banimo to Aitape to Wewak to Bogia to Medang to Long Island and New Guinea Islands. Waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to Kiwai Island to Kerama, Yule Island to Hood Point, Samare Island with waters of eastern and western Milne Bay Islands with waters of Samare Island to Cape Vogel to Finchhafen, seas of 0.5 to 1.3 metres. Waters of Finchhafen to Vitia Strait, Dampier Strait to Siasi Islands and Long Island, seas of 1.5 to 2 metres. Waters of Long Island to Medang, to Bogia, to Wewak, Aitape to Vanimo, northern PNG Indonesian border, seas of 2 to 3 metres. 
and waters of Manus and its western group of islands, with waters of New Britain to New Ireland and Bougainville seas of 2 to 2.5 meters. Ocean forecast for PNG areas in the Coral Sea, seas slight with southeast winds at 10 to 15 knots. In the Solomon Sea, seas slight with southwest to northwest winds at 10 to 15 knots. In the Bismarck Sea, seas rather rough with northwest winds at 20 to 25 knots. And in the Pacific Ocean, seas slight to moderate with northeast winds at 10 to 20 knots. Details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And that's the way it is this Sunday, the 11th of February 2018. On behalf of the news team, pleasant viewing. Good nights.